Good morning from the cool, crisp Saturday morning air here in Davos. I'm Peter Zemsky, a dean at INSEAD Business School, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest this morning, Tim Hunt. Um, we're going to be talking about what he's learned about research, innovation, how we can apply that, hopefully, in our organizations, and, and even in how we educate our young people. Um, Tim, you're a just distinguished, eloquent scientist, Nobel laureate. Um, one of the things that makes you special is, well, like everyone in the room, you've got, as I understand it, tens of trillions of cells, um, right? And um, <laughs> Roughly five right, times 10 to the 13th. 13th. Yes. To be precise, that's good. Uh, and, uh, it is thought. It is thought. Um, and un like everyone else, but li unlike everyone else, you set out to really understand the process by which those cells are formed. Every cell coming from division and well, you're well, going to correct I, me in a second. No, I, yeah, <laughs> that's not quite right. I mean, you know, I didn't yeah. set out like that. I set out, um, actually, you know, I mean, the reason why I set out where I set out was because one day I was having a, a tutorial in Cambridge, and I had a terrible cold. And I went into the room with my mates, and uh, my supervisor said, Tim, you look terrible here, and handed me half a tumbler full of whiskey. And that made me want to work with him. Very good. <laughs> so I did. And he ran a very loose ship, actually. Um, but one where you could do anything you wanted in the modern, in the then modern era of DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis, which was the, the, hot, mm. the hot thing at the time. And so, 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 I said to Asher, so what should I work on? And he said, well, why don't you go to the library and find yourself a project? So I did. I found myself a very good project, um, which luckily for me didn't work because it still hasn't been solved to this day. Uh, and I very much doubt whether had I worked on it, it would have been <laughs> solved then. Um, and actually, the, the thing that really set me on my path was going to a meeting, my first scientific meeting in Cambridge, which was about hemoglobin synthesis, the, the stuff that you breathe with, the stuff that makes your blood red. and. Um, there were two lectures there. One, a very um, great professor from Caltech who compared, bizarrely, sea urchin eggs at fertilization to red blood cells. Now, actually, red blood cells and sea urchin eggs have essentially nothing in common except they're round. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but it, I think it planted a seed in me. And then the other thing was a very distinguished uh, scientist who, who mentioned a very interesting hypothesis, which we realized he had got completely wrong when the graduate students went back to the lab and mm. told each other about it and, and things. So, you know, I can't imagine why we did it now. I can't imagine doing it. But, you know, we said, well, you know, that's so interesting. Why don't we just find so, out whether he's right or wrong? And and so were you setting out at that point to understand why cells divide? No, no, absolutely not. That was not, not the question. Absolutely Because this is question. what we're going to learn yeah, no, from no, all the, of the these sea urchins. And yeah, yeah. I, no, I mean, what I was set out to, it was very simple. So this hemoglobin, the red stuff, has a red pigment, which is called heme, and then a protein called globin, which has two different subunits called alpha and beta. And the problem was, how do you coordinate? It was a sort of, what, what do you call that? A sort of logistics problem. Yes, yes. You know, just in time. Very you, good, yes, yes. <laughs> now I'm understanding you. That's good. I appreciate it. Very good. So um, you're trying to solve so this was, cell logistic we, problem. We were, just, we were just trying to find out how you coordinate the, the supply and the assembly of these, these things. And that, 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 that took about 10 years to figure out. And eventually it was figured out. And um, it was my first really important discovery. And it was very exciting and got quite a lot of press. You know? and, mm. uh, but then the problem was I'd solved the problem that I'd been working on for 10 years. And um, I didn't have a problem anymore. Mm. And so I looked around for new ones, and I, and I realized that I'd remembered this thing of Henry Borsuk's, that when sea urchin eggs were fertilized, they turned on protein synthesis. And I thought, I've been studying this thing, how you turn off protein synthesis, which is really what the heme thing was all about. And uh, why don't I go and study sea urchins? And it's the exact opposite, and it's in some ways much more exciting and interesting what, what happens at fertilization. You know, mm. we all got fertilized. And yes. We all have fertilized, and, you know, it's, it's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so I found a friend who... Um, so you discovered sex at that point. Is that the... Yeah, well, well, a little bit before. Well, that's very good. Before, yeah. um, and I found a friend who... We became friends, actually, through our joint love of bicycling. Hmm. 
And I lent him my bicycle. He came to a meeting in Cambridge. I lent him my bicycle for a bike ride. And it turned out that he was teaching summer courses in Woods Hole, uh, which I knew about from a previous existence. And I, when he said, would I help teach that course, I jumped at the chance because A, I like teaching, and B, um, you could mess around with sea urchin eggs. So I started studying the sea urchin eggs. And actually, the first year I was there, um, it turned out, I, I mean, I thought all American labs were brilliantly equipped. And of this course. one was That's brilliantly equipped for studying fertilization, because that was the thing. You fertilized, every, you know, eggs of every <laughs> phylum known to man. Yes, it was yes. terrific. I learned a lot. But um, in terms of my problem, it was woefully under-equipped. So I vowed I would never go back there. And we spent a lot of that summer sort of dancing and going down to the bar late at night. It was quite hard work. And having a pizza at about quarter to midnight, and they stopped serving at midnight. And it was, it, was, it was good fun, but worthless scientifically. But the seed there again was planted. And little do we know, there's a Nobel Prize lurking in yeah, here exactly, somewhere. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. <laughs> well, little did I know. But anyway, yes, yes. So, so I went, I went, I didn't go back the, the following year. But then I found I missed it very much. And I missed, I'd sort of forgotten how much fun it is to learn things at that point. Mm. And uh, I learned a lot of stuff by listening to these lectures and also by doing things and by teaching how people how to do things. I mean, science is very much of an apprenticeship, and it still is, I think. You know, mm. you actually have, there's, there's, some people have it and some people don't, and it's not, it's not, it's a sort of funny combination of brain power and mm -mm -mm. So actually, so Doing. now you give us a, you know, a sense of you know, how you mucked around and, and then things come out. Have you drawn lessons in terms of now as your senior scientist and, and helping steer this whole sort of intellectual ecosystem? What is it that we should be doing to help nurture younger, younger scientists? Well, I, the thing I always liked, but I don't suppose it's for everybody, I hated lecturing, actually. <laughs> found talking about things that I didn't really know about quite demanding. But I loved teaching practical courses and thinking up little projects. I mean, we kept on in, the, in Cambridge. We had mm. students in the lab for eight weeks. And some people said, oh, this is ghastly because they're so disruptive. I thought it was great because they were so smart and they worked so hard. And, and they could, there are some problems where it's good to explore a large space. And it was great having these extra pairs of hands because it didn't really matter whether their projects worked or didn't work. Um, mm. Usually they did work, I may say, but you know the, you, they could explore a space which um, you couldn't or didn't have the time to do yourself. And if there were sort of little glimmerings, you could say, "Oh, that's going to work. Let's, mm. let's carry mm. on mm. with mm. when the project was over." And they learned a lot, and we learned a lot. Mm. I mean, and, and and I had some fantastically good students actually at a short <coughs> period of time. As you probably know, one of the things people have been discussing around Davos the last few days has been online courses and potentially taking people yeah, like you out of the I, big I, lecture I, hall. I feel those are completely antithetical. I like, I, I really, you know, I've always liked messing around. When I was a kid, I liked messing around, taking things apart and melting things and making circuits and building so, radios and that kind of and, stuff. And so even now, I mean, do you, as a, as a senior Scientist, do you do you like to run big labs with lots of little ants? No, I and, like uh, no, no. Do you, or do you I, let do you no, let I the like, little the people muck around I, as well? I, I like people to get on with whatever they, you know. I mean, a, a project hopefully of mutual interest. I, I mean, I just recently had somebody who was doing something I didn't know anything mm. about and really couldn't help with, and I found that most unsatisfactory. But you know, she wanted to do it, and so yeah, I was yeah, I to yeah. say no. Yes, yes. <laughs> but then at the same time, I had a, a wonderful Japanese postdoc who was possibly the best collaborator I've ever had, and a, a tremendous joy. I realized that um, the thing I like the best is working with one or two mm. people. I mean, a very intense relationship, actually, almost like a love affair, I, I would say, you know, the, the sort of degree of mutual understanding. And, and it's just so nice to have somebody that you can, you know, when something goes well, to share the... The, the, the journey, the, 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 the triumph with, and when mm, things mm. are going badly, to have somebody to sort of say, "Here, why don't we go and have a drink yes. or whatever?" Yeah. What do you look Maybe. for in collaborators then? Do you, you look for people who oh. uh, similar to you, well, different? I, you know, we often talk. Complementarity, I think, is often a good thing. Actually, I had a long-term colleague in Cambridge, and he was really—I mean, he, a he was cleverer than I was by quite a wide margin, and b he was very good at the detail, whereas I was always sort of urging him to, you know, look at the big picture. I think I'm better at the big picture than the. Than the detail. Although mm. I can still do, you know, 
the sort of the great discovery which I made at, 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 in almost the last time I went taught in Woods Hole was that there was this protein which disappeared, which is a strange discovery. And, uh, <laughs> but, but it did disappear, and it turned out that it had to disappear, otherwise cells couldn't couldn't divide. Mm. Um, so that, and, which was enormously exciting because nobody had ever thought that uh, proteins going away, being degraded, was part of part of life. I mean, people sort of knew it happened, but it was sort of seen in terms of, oh, well, you know, the protein just gets tired <coughs> and old, and we've got to replace it. But this was a case where the protein had done a very important job, and then not only did you not need it anymore, you had to get rid of it, otherwise you couldn't, you couldn't go on. You know, it was like a barrier yep. which you had to Was that something, so, so you're saying everyone had thought that, you know, <coughs> What's important is the proteins that come, and no one was really thinking about when they go away. Yes, was it, I mean, was it hard? For, was it staring people in the face? And they no, just it wasn't. Missing it them? wasn't. It was only because I was working on sea urchin eggs, and this was a very abundant protein at this very early time. Who who knew? I mean, it was. It had been known. In fact, it was the old Borsuk again who had discovered that protein synthesis was very important after fertilization. If you didn't make new proteins, the the eggs did not divide. Mm. Uh, and I, when I saw this protein disappear, well. That explained everything. You had to make the protein to get it to initiate division, and you had to degrade it to complete yep. division. I mean, very, very simple, but so unlikely that nobody had thought of it before. And in the end, that, that as I understand it, that insight with the sea urchin eggs shined light on cell division. Absolutely, movement. yeah. I mean, it took about another five years to figure out what it was and who its mate was, and then that got us together with some very interesting mm -hmm. and distinguished yeast geneticists. So this was, it also had the effect of so, bringing together sort of molecular biologists and geneticists and biochemists. So let's just talk, start talking a little bit about, if that's the nature of scientific discovery, and that's- That's those, as I've experienced as it. As you've experienced it. Yeah. Um, what, what, what does that then tell you about how we should be organizing this? So when we go out and we, we, you know, society spends billions and billions on scientists, how should we best channel that money into, you know, how do we pick the projects they're going to... Well, I think they pick themselves. I mean, I, I've recently been involved in two kinds of things. I'm on the council of the ERC, which gives out grants to individuals, okay, throughout mm. Europe. Europe we, don't, yes. we, don't, we don't care what their nationality or gender or anything is. Mm. We just ask that they be terrific scientists, and we don't tell them what to do. We just say, if, we say, you know, give us your ideas, and if we like them, uh, we'll give you the money. That's it, so Terribly in, simple <coughs> system. So even in business, in venture, you know, there's always a debate. You know, do you bet on the idea or on the team and the, it's, the individuals? It's, and it's, this is it's, it's the person. It's the person. person. You know, and uh, they they may have a big team or they may have a small team, but they'll they'll write it down in a grant, and their mm. grant will be assessed by a panel of their peers, an international panel of their peers, and uh, you know the the best ones float to the top, and the the bottom. Mm. 80 to 90 percent will, well, they'll have another chance That's the, next, the, next, the next time around. But I, th I think this is the way to do it, rather than, which uh, a lot of politicians like, is the idea, you know, we have a grand challenge. We want to understand the brain. Mm. Well, I want to understand the brain, and that would be great. But I wouldn't have a clue if I was the grand panjandrum, you know, who to tell what to do to understand mm. the brain. Right? But uh, you could say, well, you know, we should have a Manhattan Project to understand the brain. The brain. Mm. But actually, you know, lots of scientists want to understand the brain. They're doing the best they can the way they can. And I think the, what we have to do is to identify the really, the really good ones. I'm a great sort of yeah. believer in, in other words, in the cottage industry and the bottom-up. Bottom-up. I was going to say, clearly much approach. more a bottom-up um, view of science you know, and progress. So to that extent, I think the, the ER, I, you know, I absolutely 101% approve of the principles of the ERC, and I wonder why it's taken so long to do this very simple thing, because in the scientific community, we've known for ages that that seems, I mean, it looks rather inefficient. It looks a bit sort of winky-wonky and mm. sort of random walky and, and stuff, but it, the, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and you know, this, this works, and uh, the top-down directorial thing might work for Manhattan projects for big engineering projects where you do have to collect big teams. It worked for the Human Genome Project, I must say. Mm, of um, course. But I think, you know, that we just, there's just so much to learn, so much to find out that this so, bottom-up thing okay. is better. Just to probe a little bit, when you're, when you're looking at the, the, the individuals or the small teams to bet on, what, 
I mean, I guess one thing you, you look for is the, the track record and output. Are there other things that you well, personally it, it, would look at when you decide? It's kind of interesting, actually. And here again, I think this is, this is <laughs> it's terribly simple but quite innovative. Uh, the ERC basically takes the view that half of the input is the, the record of the person. Because on the whole, you know, if you've made great discoveries in the past and people admire you, you're probably going to go on the same unless something horrible has happened to you. And half on the project. Mm. You know, it's got to be sensible and well worked out. So I've seen it, you know, that people you've never heard of have fantastically good projects. They get the money. I've seen, our, you know, great heroes of science, Nobel Prize winners even, uh, have their projects turned down because they, you know, either hadn't done enough preliminary <coughs> work to convince the panel that it was going to work. I mean, I had an amu rather embarrassing case is John Gurdon, who won this year's Nobel Prize. And mm. I'm sorry to say that the ERC it's turned him down. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. But the reason was, he, I, and I spoke to him about this. I said, I'm terribly sorry, John. <laughs> <I bet you laughs> <did. laughs> Wish now that we'd given you the money. No, he said, you know, that was absolutely the right thing to do because I really, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to work. It was, a good, it was a good suggestion, but I hadn't done enough preliminary work and maybe hadn't worked hard mm. enough on the actual, the grant. Yeah. Writing. You bring so up. It's okay. To, to, to push you a little, though, you, you, you bring up the, uh, the successor to the Manhattan Project, the, the genome sequencing, and, and suddenly there's just all this data coming out. And, yes. and, you know, do we, this cottage industry that you described, do we really still need that? When Absolutely. we have, you know, the, the, the genome, we could just now sit down and, and look it up and find <laughs> out exactly, ah, here's how cell division works. What's, yeah, what's, yeah. what's well, maybe is, Europe thing of the past? Uh, how I, did you. You know, the, the, it just doesn't work like that. I mean, you know, so that. Um, I figured out that the, the human genome is the equivalent of 137 complete works of Shakespeare with no mm. punctuation, no... There are separate volumes, that's all there is. There are 23 volumes, volumes and, that's <laughs> <laughs> and then that's it, you know, but there are no commas, a, there are no paragraphs. And, and, and do we, and do we somehow, speak the language that it's written in? <laughs> <laughs> it, yes, if you, if you stick it into an unfertilized egg, you know, you'll get out... If you started with a human being, you'll get back a human being. being. If it's a chimpanzee, a chimpanzee, a cat, a cat. Uh, mm. it, it's terrific, but the cells know where in that volume to go and look for, for the information they need at the time, and it's not just one information. I mean, most cells make, I don't know, five to 10,000 different proteins at any mm. one time. <clears throat> in some cases, there'll be one per cell or 10, and in some cases, there'll be hundreds of thousands per cell. So, I mean... So uh, the point is it, just having these many, many volumes of Shakespeare unpunctuated that's just, that's an input, but there's still... How you, how you interpret that to yeah. build a nose or an eye or a hand is, is we haven't, well, I mean, you know, we know the general principles, but working it out in detail is going to be the work of hundreds of years, I suspect, well, actually. Have you seen the latest Spider-Man movie? <laughs> no. You know, they, they have this, you know, you, you know, where your hand gets cut off and you can grow a new one. We're not, are we close to that? Or? Well, you know, people study that, and it's very interesting to know why newts can do it, or axolotls, mm. I guess, is what the people study it. They can do it very nicely, but we can't. But yet we can do it for our kidneys and our livers, you know, so some organs can do it mm. and other, others, others can't. And there are the, you know, I mean, I think it would be a good thing to work on. More, so more. lurking someplace in one of those volumes of Shakespeare, there may it's, be it, yes, you know, a and scene you that we could play. If you compare the axolotl instructions with the human instructions, you say, oh, they've got this. And if we gave, you know, I mean, not a very ethical, but let's say, you know, you, so you give a baby this new gene and lo and behold, cut off their hand, they grow a new one. I mean, yeah, right. how fantastic would that be? Quite. And that's, I mean, this is not really science fiction. Well, I mean, more, more at home is the fact that, you know, look, we have a diabetic, their pancreas is failing. We'd like to be able to build a new pancreas yes. from one of their own cells. And that's, this is now, this is coming in within sight. I mean, that's, wow. that's, that's going to be the next thing. We're not there yet, but I, I don't think it's all that far off. A, f a friend of mine, is, is, for example, was able to take a single cell from your gut and reconstitute the gut in a test tube. I mean, it's not quite the gut, it doesn't actually form a tube, but I mean, basically the basic sort of local mm, 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 tissues mm, 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 are, are reconstituted, simply because he figured out what the, what the, the growth factors were, the chemicals, the mostly proteins that he had to add to, to the solution. I think that's a fantastic advance. And again, and for you, it's a, this is still the individual and that's cottage industry again. working on yeah. individual yeah. mechanisms. Yeah, very smart guy, so, attracting very smart students and just getting on with it. Makes me think of it. So one of the things we, we talk about in business these days is big data. 
right? Because out there in the internet, we yeah. have just, just well, biologists are pretty of, keen you know, on this, this too. But and I, how, and what's your uh, well, I think it's you know it can be very very useful, but it's but it needs an awful lot of sifting through to make sense uh, of. Yes, it's the sense. I mean, you can get lost as well you in the data. You can get totally lost. lost, and I think there are there is a group of people today who think that if you just sort of you know, take the human body and mash it up and throw the DNA and all the proteins on the floor in a big Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> Somehow you could reconstitute the, the, the mm. person. It just ain't so, I don't oh. think. I, 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 I think we need to know how things actually work, and that means doing experiments on the individual subsystems. Okay, so uh, let me push again. So one thing we, we, we certainly see in the, the social world is this incredible expertise on subsystems. So you might have traders or, or financial engineers creating these derivatives um, that can be very deep, very sophisticated, and yet somehow the understanding of the system falls short and you get things like the mortgage crisis. Yes, How, exactly. And so people then call for, well, we have to have more systems thinking. In biology, there's been some call as well. Has that played out well? Has coming at it with a systems thinking well, really uh -huh. helped? There are a lot of people who would call themselves systems biologists, mm. and I, uh, in very rare cases, have I found this useful. On the whole, I mean, there was a whole, there is a whole journal called the Journal of Theoretical Biology, which, to my mind, has never produced anything of any use whatsoever. Oh, okay. so, so you have, <laughs> you don't have strong views on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a friend mm. now. I, I know mm. two people. Um, my, my Hungarian friend is uh, very keen on um, modeling the cell cycle, and I found it very helpful to talk mm. to him because his differential equations sort of mesh with my molecules, and I can sort of, you know, we, mm, we, mm, we mm, speak mm, the mm, same mm. language. And the question is, does it work? Is his model complete? I mean, so this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is useful, but I think we're very far from being able to sort of take all the information we have and assemble it into a sort of computer image of which will work. I mean, we just don't understand how things work, wherever you, wherever you look, I mean, left, right, and center. No. So we've got miles to go, in my view, and I think we, we're going to need people like me, and <coughs> uh, I just think this is the way, you know, small science has, has been, for the most part, much more effective. The big science, the genome thing, that, that just, you know, it's helpful to have that library of things out there. You know what you're dealing with, but it's just a resource. It isn't really the explanation, mm. and I think people are apt to confuse that. They think that the, having uh, this data well, is the thing. Maybe then we could talk a little bit then about this issue of where, where the next scientists are coming from. And so I can imagine, you know, this Facebook generation, which you know, challenges authority, <laughs> is, is that sort of going to feed? Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, I'm not sure they challenge the authority when it, when it really matters. I, hmm. I was uh, just this week earlier on in uh, atop a mountain somewhere else in Switzerland, and we were talking to some chemistry graduate students there, and part of the exercise, it was supposed to be a, a workshop in creativity or something like hmm. that, they had to come up with a research project with their peers, sort of sitting around. It's not, not a very good way to find research projects in a committee, but it was just a little exercise. But I was very surprised how limited the horizons of these youngsters were, and I do worry that the present pressure to sort of just do what you know about and is, is really sort of forcing them in on themselves, hmm. and that they're, they're, they're not getting that grand, that grand view or any experience of how their little part of the universe mm. fits in with everything else. So we're getting very compartmentalized. Almost even too, too compartmentalized. Too com compartmentalized. Well, well, just in, in, in what do you think the forces are that are, are, are that, because they're not, you know. I think it's sort of a, it's, it's a sort of um, over-professionalization of something which is basically a kind of apprenticeship system and a sort of feeling that, uh, you know, you've got to have all those certificates. I, I think that, uh, you know, when I look back on my own career, I mean, it was so random. I mean, there was so much messing around and having fun with other people and, and just trying things. Mm. And now it's almost as though that's mm. sort of forbidden, as though everybody thinks everything is so cut and dried that we already know enough. You can't sort of allow people to mess around because, damn it, there's a serious job to be done. But I think, you know, the, 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 we, there are still many, many important discoveries to be made, which can only be made by sort of mm. turning over stones out of pure curiosity. So if you think about you know, uh, lots of discussion these days about you know, what should modern research universities do, what's their role in educating, how, so 
this notion of getting more and more specialized, especially for you know, people in college, university, you're, you're not... Well, I think, I mean, one of the glories of a university is that you actually get to meet other people, you know. I mean, you're a scientist, but you have a friend who is a classicist, right? Mm. I mean, no, that, no. That, that, I think that's important. And it was very nice in Cambridge. You would, you would find yourself sitting next at dinner to some expert on medieval history, or, and you'd find out what they, were, what they were up to. I'm not sure that ever sort of made me have a great scientific no, insight, no, no. but it certainly improved the quality of life, and it certainly improved the quality of the people who wanted to be in that kind of environment. And of course, that's another thing. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I lived for about 10 years in Cambridge in the most unbelievably beautiful set of rooms that looked out over the most unbelievably gorgeous lawn. Now, I mean, huge green lawn with this great medieval cathedral-like building just to the left, King's College Chapel. Now, you know, if we were a business, we'd have said, we're not going to let this lawn last, right? Because we should be building a skyscraper well, devoted to learning on it. But the fact of the matter is, you know, <laughs> that lawn is saying something about where our values are. And it's, it's sort of hard to, you know, I mean, why do... Why do the kids all want to go to Oxford and Cambridge? What is it exactly? Is it because they're beautiful, or is it because everybody tells them that that's the place yeah, to go? Spark, it's yes. a, you know, it's a sort of funny combination of things. But I mean, I think if the play, if we were to rip down all the medieval buildings and build concrete and steel boxes, you know, it mm -hmm. wouldn't be as popular anymore. If you were if you were starting out again, where knowing what you know about science, where it's going. Where would, you, uh, where would you think of specializing? Oh, I, oof, I don't know. I mean, I always tell the youngsters they should go and work on the brain because I think that's such, a, such an important thing. And so, you mm. know, there are just so many great mysteries. I was having a wonderful conversation this morning with Roger Chen, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering the green fluorescent protein and have, figuring out how it works. Yes, yes. He's very interested in the brain, and he's particularly interested in, in how, how, how you remember things, what's the basis of of memory, and it was, it was, it was terrific. So, I mean, I, I really love that. I mean, the, the possibility of interacting with, with people like that, and that's the idea of a great university. I mean, that you will, you know, there is something extraordinarily stimulating about meeting no. great I mean, minds. I mean, one of the amazing things, as we start to get uh, deeper understanding of the brain, you start to get um, that, the, the scope for interdisciplinary work, right? The, it's yes, start, yes. Within no, I mean, it sort of it seeing... shades into philosophy, you know. Yes, I mean, whether consciousness is a scientific problem or a philosophical no, I mean, one is an interesting no, question. I mean, in some ways, the, I don't know. The, you know, no, the original yeah. promise of the university as this, this place where you really probe the human condition and from all these angles, we might actually get there at some point. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's an interesting question. When, you know, when we will you get to the end of end of time. People occasionally say that, you know, we, we know everything there is to know, and it's patently it's obvious that that is not true. No, as, a, as, a, no, as you said, I mean, when you, when you think about the brain, there are just so many amazing questions there to be probed. Well, you see, it's we don't even understand the little tiny nematode worm. We have the complete wiring diagram of the worm. Yes. We know exactly how it behaves, and yet we can't explain how the nervous system uh, coordinates that behavior. So if you can't even understand a thing that only has 50 neurons, what hope have you for <laughs> somebody with ah. 50 billion neurons or whatever we Interesting. have? Interesting. Well, that lead the other. I mean, is the time really right to then understand the human brain? Or should we uh, be prob actually... Probably not, actually. Probably, actually, probably, actually, probably not. That. We should be studying worms or flies or, or something so just like a, that. A question, though, when you come to the ERC board and you're proposing to study a worm, will you do as well as the person who's going to study the well, brain? Well, I think you're probably more likely to do well if you if you've got a sensible project with a model organism rather than trying to do this. You know, I mean, if, 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 if it means sort of opening up a human brain to look inside, this is, you know, uh, mm. uh, mm, right? Uh, there, are, there, are, there are difficulties there. Um, Very good. Um, what about in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, one thing we talk about in, in, in business is, you know, sort of the role of competition. How, how competitive have you, oh, you found? Oh, yeah, no, that's uh, an interesting question, actually. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, competition is fantastically important. It is the sort of the lifeblood. Everyone complains about it, but actually, um, it what drives things forward. And if the business you're in is not competitive, it allows you to go be sort of sluggish and idle. If you think somebody is on your tail, mm. it's a tremendous stimulus. So I think that um, 
I mean, for example, I, I mentioned this thing of the coordination of heme and globin synthesis. So after I finished my postdoc with a guy who was very interested in, in that question, I went back to Cambridge to rejoin my mates there. And um, we worked on it in, in vicious competition with the, with the old boss, who I liked very much. You know, so I, but what, the, the, and the funny thing is that actually, you know, these two groups, these two people often, are, um, you know, they, they know each other exceedingly well and they care very much about the same mm. thing. But, but. The, but, but you want to get there first. first. And we got there first. <laughs> and, you know, there's a tremendous feeling of uh, pride and satisfaction in that. All right, Tim, I think we're running low on time. So thank you very much for a, a just a fascinating window into the actually how you push forward the, the frontiers of knowledge. Um, any sort of closing thoughts you, you want to? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, no, it's, it's hard, you know, how, how one should organize these, these things. I, I'd just make a plea for people doing more. There has been a tendency to think everything can be done on a computer, and I think there's no substitute for actually grappling with nature hand to hand. Getting your hands dirty. Still. Getting your hands dirty, rolling up your sleeves and getting your hands dirty, yes. Very important. And, uh, you know, in the computer age, people say that's not necessary anymore. In my view, it's just as necessary now as it ever was. Uh, and um, we need to pe find people who are prepared to do that, who don't find that sort of hum humble work uh, demeaning, because I think it's sort of terrific, actually. Thank you very much, Tim. Pleasure.